Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. Nick Wright is about to stop by, but before we start with Nick, grab your phone, download the Game Time app. It takes 90 seconds. It's now the authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets easier and even faster. Prices on the Game Time app, believe it or not, go down the closer you get to the first pitch. They have killer last-minute deals. Uh, views from your seat, anything you need, lowest prices guaranteed with a Game Time app. Zone deals. That's one of the things they have at Game Time. Zone deals. You pick the section, Game Time picks the seats. Big time savings. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with a Game Time app. Download it, 90 seconds. Put in the code Colin, C O L I N, 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms, of course, apply. Again, Create the account. Code is Colin. Twenty bucks off. Download the Game Time app today. La Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, uh, bring in Nick Wright. Probably every other week, and we just ramble for about fifty-five minutes to an hour. We're talking about a variety of subjects today. No particular order. Here we go. LeBron James' son is an NBA athlete. I don't think right now, currently, he's quite an NBA player. I think they would draft him, send him to the G League, give him a year. And he, Mick Cronin said the other day, the UCLA coach, he's not as quick or as fast as he was pre-cardiac arrest. He's not quite the player. But I watched him, but I've watched him enough, seen his hops, seen his handles. He got a beautiful jumper. He got a beautiful that, looking right, jumper. Is, I like his it, jumper it better. It looks good. His first shooting percentage is not good, but it doesn't look like there's a problem with it. I agree with you there. No. In fact, I like it better than his dad's. I think his shooting is very natural. Bigger players don't yet generally, you know, Larry Bird, sure. KD, the exception. A lot of times the 6'4 guy's got the perfect jumper, the perfect look, the perfect hand size. But here, here's the thing. And I don't know how necessarily to explain this. Is that this is the worst draft. Maybe as bad as the Anthony Bennett draft. So as more mothers are telling their kids, do not play football. More mothers. This is yeah, in definitely. Los Angeles. I have a buddy that lives in, in Brentwood. He's like, I'm like an outcast for letting my kids play tackle football. I was at a sidebar to it. I was at a a card game with some uh, Hollywood and finance folks. Low stakes for the, by, by it, their standards for sure, or else I wouldn't have been able to play in it. And there was a very, very smart guy there who... Had enough money that he all, when I was like, how do I know this name? I didn't know who he was at the time, but I was like, I know this name. So after I left the card game, I Googled his name and I was like, oh, you almost bet. You almost bet. You almost bought this baseball team like six years ago. I won't say the, um, yeah. but he said that like he, and he was a very sharp guy and he was like, yeah, I don't think football should be legal under 18 years old. And I didn't agree with him, but my, th I'm just e echoing your point. That that There are a lot of people that are not letting their kids even consider playing tackle football. Particularly, I think I bet it skews higher income and things like that. But go ahead, as you were saying, about Bronny. Yet, you can get Brock Purdy in the final pick. Yeah. Half the league is undrafted. Kurt Warner, Tony Romo undrafted. The NBA is a global game, and people are suggesting there are not three surefire NBA starters in this no draft. Question. There's two rounds. There's almost no players after the 12th pick. It's a cheaper sport to play. Hockey and football are expensive. It's a global sport. Is that saying that the NBA is so good it's impossible to make it? Is it saying our domestic culture is broken and our players are distracted and not skilled enough? How in the world could you have a global sport? We don't have a shortage of great baseball players, great hockey players. We're having drafts. Well, like every third draft is terrible. Yeah, but I, so I think it's actually more the first than the second because I the league is more talented now than at any point in my lifetime. There and so True. I I think it is less that oh my god there's not good players it's that the bar for being considered a good player these days is so much higher 
than it once was. And your pal Bill Simmons talks about this a lot, but like the the guys who are now ninth men, you know, not that long ago would be good starters. Good, like good. And if you look at some teams that we thought of as very good teams 20 years ago and look at who they had after their top four guys, it's a bunch of, huh? And so that it's an argument for expansion. It's an argument for adding teams to the league because the talent level right now is so high. Like you look at the Western Conference in the NBA right now, we have, as we record this, the Lakers and the Warriors are the nine and the 10 seeds. It's insane. And keep in mind. So next year, so think about the Western Conference and the NBA next year. And then I want to circle back to Bronny for a moment. So Minnesota is not going to be worse. I mean, I don't know if they're going to be the one seed, but it's not like all of a sudden Minnesota is going to go away. I'm just going to go down the standings. Denver is here to stay. Oklahoma City is only getting better. The Clippers maybe take a step back, but if they bring everyone back, why would they not maintain about where they are? Dallas seems to have figured out the Luka Kyrie thing. They're you know, they're even they're playing, playing defense. defense. Luka's a uh, top three player in the league, hands down. They're fine. Phoenix. Uh, yeah, okay, so Phoenix could go backwards because of the age of their guys, but it's not like they're going to be a disaster. New Orleans is a young team. Sacramento is a young team. The Lakers, the Warriors. And then you have Memphis with Ja coming back. The Wimby is coming for everybody. And Houston was an exciting team. That's 13 teams. It's 15 teams in the <laughs> conference. So there's just the teams are so talented and so loaded. I think that's about the draft. I want to defend the Bronny thing for a minute, if I could. Sure. So what if this is... Can can everyone, even the biggest LeBron James critics, acknowledge the guy's all-time basketball IQ-wise? Can we at least acknowledge that? That the guy understands how the game is played and understands the NBA as well as anybody ever has. Okay. Yeah. For folks arguing... Oh my gosh, LeBron's putting his finger on the scale. He shouldn't. Why would he do it? He's hurting his son in the long run. He's undercutting. I don't know that this is the math LeBron is doing, but it's just an idea. What if LeBron's thought process is, on this current trajectory, in today's college basketball climate, my kid is not going to get the development and improvement that he needs over the next three years to one day be an NBA player. Hmm. However, if I do put my finger on the scale and get a team to be at least somewhat invested in his development, then by the time I'm gone, he will be good enough to be a legitimate stand on his own two feet NBA player. And so not that dissimilar from how Seth Curry went undrafted and then bounced around the G League for two years, getting multiple chances, I happen to believe, in part because of who his brother is. And then through that development, now he's a legitimate, really good NBA player. Would that have happened if he didn't get those opportunities that I think he probably got because of who his brother was. No. Do I think that is fair? I don't know. Define fair. Is it absolutely what I think I would do if I were in LeBron's place? Am I like, of course. If I can help my kid achieve his dream and he might not be able to without my help, of course I'm going to. And, 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 uh, and, and, and folks whining about it, like people in the NBA sell second round picks for two million bucks these are not like the hottest commodities like oh my god you're gonna waste a second round pick teams throw them in willy-nilly teams sell them and so yeah i mean i listen bron what's gonna hurt Bronny is he's six two and i i i know mannix and shams and other people have said he's an nba level defender it's just hard to be a great defender in this league at that size i'm not saying he can't be um, but I don't, I don't think LeBron is doing 
is being unfair to anybody in this cir circumstance whatsoever. I think my my example that makes me laugh the most is every time you're driving and you see a plumbing truck, it always says Johnson and Sons. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, this is, we can talk about it being problematic, but we've only had 46, 47 presidents in this country. One were father and son, but the other, one were uncle and nephew. Like even up to presidential level of this country, there's nepotism. The NFL and NBA front offices and coaching staffs are rife with it. Those those last names all being the same are not a goddamn coincidence. It, it, it is right. because people, you know, the Kyle Shanahan, you know, being Mike Shanahan's son, and his part of history is Mike Lafleur with Matt Lafleur, and, and then I mean the the Brian Callahan, the, wait, Bill Callahan has two sons that are NFL coaches. Like we're used to it everywhere and for some reason people are not as comfortable with it in pro sports but i it, we haven't because we haven't seen this i guess because nobody's ever in the nba right. played long enough for this to be a a real possibility so i thought there was sort of an ugly moment with caitlin clark when some former uconn players you know on a telecast were kind of taking shots at her and i'm like ladies well, this comes across so petty. Like, she's dominant at college. And I've always had this basketball vibe, is that as long as you're a reasonable height, now there are high school guys that are 5'9", average 30 a game, they get to college, they're not big enough. Or college guys, you know, the off guard that's six one and a half playing a two guard at, in, in, in college, you can't make it in the NBA. But if you're of regular, normal height in the league and you're going into, no defense has ever stopped any great score, score, score. There was no Kobe stopper, MJ stopper. Tony Allen was a great defender. And guys got there. They got what they wanted to get. Is that, and I think that's transferable. I think there are certain things, men's and women's game that are transferable. One of the first things I noticed when I watched her, she never looks at the ball. Uh, I mean, she, it, it is totally always looking connected up the to court her hand. Or at the rim or at teammates. She, she reminds me of the Mahomes where she's scrambling, never really to run. It's the last option. He is always looking for people. A lot of guys just, the smaller guys run to yes. not get hit. Tyler Murray's looking to not yes. get hit. Patrick's looking to hit somebody downfield. Correct. Big difference. So the first couple of times I watched her last year, I'm like, boy, she is, that's like NBA. Like that ball is, even college guys sometimes, you can see they're protecting the ball. She's magic. That That ball is connected to her. Her court vision because of that is substantial. Like, and again, this sounds like, well, everybody can dribble no. without watching. There are players that are connected and to the And by the ball. way, the, go, just, if you think everybody can dribble without looking at it, go watch. The Celtics might win the title this year. The second best player can dribble with his left hand. Like, I mean, the, I mean, the idea that everybody can do it. No, they can't. Um, yeah, Isaiah Ryder, I covered, had no <laughs> left hand. He could not Isaiah dribble with his left hand. Um, And so, he, listen, I, prior to Caitlin Clark, I thought Diana Taurasi was the best women's player I'd ever seen. Uh, Cheryl Miller. Right, from and me. I just didn't see Cheryl. And, like the, and so yeah. I trust everyone on Cheryl, but I just didn't see her. And I'm like... Last year of high school, 82 for me, 83. Yeah. She was the... When you were in college, she was... There were arguments. Could the she NBA. make the NBA? We would argue right. in college. Um, the and Griner was the most like awe inspiring, but I thought Tarazi was the best, and so I have mass respect for Tarazi. But and this is, I don't think anything Tarazi and Sue Bird said was out of bounds, I didn't think it was unfair, I don't think they need to apologize any of that. I think, but I think real equality comes with me being able to say that's a bad take, you know what. You had yeah, a bad yeah. take. And the idea, and I, listen, a lot of it is just as simple as those are UConn folks. She was playing Paige. They rooted for Paige. You know what I mean? There's real, that's my yeah. school. Got it. No problem. But the idea that Caitlin Clark is going to go to the WNBA and not immediately be excellent, I think is ridiculous. I think it is. Now, right. is she going to walk in and be the best player in the league? No, I don't think that. Is she going to walk in and be an all-star level player? 
I would be shocked if she's not. I would be shocked. Yeah. The the look at the best men's players, their rookie year, they're good. They're not, you know, Durant, LeBron. And that's one year that's in correct. college. That's the, that's the other point I was going to make. And for Dur- LeBron, none. For Durant, one. Duncan got four and was awesome year one and arguably the yes. best player in the league year two. Was finals MVP year two. Like four years, you know. And so Caitlin Clark is not going to struggle. It's just It's just a bad take to think that she is going to come yeah. to the WNBA and struggle. Will she dominate that way she did in college basketball? No. Yeah. But I I do think the South Carolina, let me put it like this. Women's, the, that South Carolina women's team is, I think, probably on par with low with some of you know the bottom five WNBA teams. I don't think the WNBA has evolved to the level of the NBA where the worst NBA team would roll the best men's college basketball team. I agree. I agree. And she didn't, you know, she didn't beat that team, but it's not like she looked in over depth. I just I don't think she's gonna struggle at all. I think she's gonna be really good and in short order be also awesome. also her WNBA teammates are gonna all be better than her Iowa well, teammates, uh, uh, meaning Boston, her passes, oh, yes, the well, finishing. Their, her teammates will correct. finish at the rim. Her teammates will hit right. the shot. I mean, Indiana got the number one pick last year and got Aaliyah Boston, who was the best player on South Carolina a year ago that lost Caitlin Clark. Yeah, I mean, that is the other thing that is going to be maybe her scoring is going to, and field goal percentage is going to suffer in the short term. Her yeah. assist percentage will not because she is going to be playing with the most talent she's ever played with by a mile, by a mile. And so, yeah, I think I think this is a super exciting wo- moment for women's sports. And I'm really, and I, I always, here is where I think the American viewing public deserves credit. Yeah. If it's awesome, we'll watch it flatly yep. if it's awesome period we'll watch it doesn't really yep. matter the sport or the gender if it's awesome and the stakes are high we can tell that's dope let's get invested and yep. so the that is where the television ratings are pretty honest when it comes to big events and how much people care. And so I like the I don't know what the ratings and stuff will be for the WNBA, but I know that right now people like the and this is the word, this word is I think I've said this to you before. The only time this word is ever used is in reference to college sports, but it's the right word. Pageantry. People do like the pageantry yeah. of college sports. They like it. They like yeah. the school spirit. They like the band. They like the fact that they're young people, but old enough to not be, you know, making terrible mistakes, but young enough, like, yo, they might airball this open shot. Like, he might miss this extra point. It adds a lot of drama and things to it. And people like getting to know teams and players and going on rides with them. And the men's game, it's gone. And so that void That's right. is now being filled by the women's game. Like people, like mm-hmm. one of the reasons this women's title did such crazy numbers is because we've been invested in Caitlin Clark's Iowa team for two years now. You know what I mean? It, it, yes. There were there was a story. Oh, they beat South Carolina and Dawn Staley last year when they were undefeated. Now is they're going to get their get back? You you get to go on the ride with them, and so. And the men's game doesn't have that coming back anytime soon. And people want it. People want it. Now, I will say, I I was talking to somebody yesterday who played college basketball. He said the NIL, you know, the the G League Ignite got booted. The NIL is going to keep kids that would normally have not given college basketball a chance. I do think that will incrementally, perhaps granularly, help college basketball a little. Uh, Zach Eady, by the way, Zach Eady. 
great for two years. Look at the ratings. UConn, great for two years. Look at the ratings. 90% of money in Hollywood is on remakes. So I do think college women's college basketball has a continuity um, yes. edge. I mean, this is this is what Ali had. He fights Norton. He fights Frazier. He gets his, you know, he wins there. He loses there. Boxing had this forever. UFC's had this. The rematches get, this is why the minute somebody loses, they talk rematch. College basketball has a rematch problem. But I do think as much as people, it, you know, it, it fosters insecurity and angst, the NIL eventually will land with, oh, it actually helps college basketball. Oh, I a think, yeah, bit. because if you can get, people to stick around for an extra year and have more of continuity that's what people want people want to you know go on these rides with you and it's something that i think the nba suffers from a bit right now which is people you know listen i am the i obviously wasn't you know i was a little little kid in the 80s but I've, i'm enough of an nba historian that i know like People want, like, they watched the Pistons come close and come close. And I understand they made tweaks, Aguirre and Dantley, you know, the train, the, the, got it. And then they finally break through. And it's, the, you know, it's it's Isaiah and Dumars and Lambeer and Rodman. And you you were invested in it. And then the Bulls went through that, say, ah, they keep losing to the Pistons. They keep losing. They finally break through. It has been... You know, Kobe with the Lakers, He at the top, Shaq leaves, he has three years out in the wilderness, then all of a sudden, you know, back on top. Because of the, just the quickness of player movement in the NBA, didn't win, leave, it, you don't, you're not taking, going on that same journey that we saw Dirk go on, that we saw these other guys go on, and I think that has probably hurt the, some of the popularity of the league a bit. And I, you know, Clay said on Draymond's podcast the other day, I thought it was really interesting. He's like, I want to stay with the Warriors, but I might have to prioritize my mental health. And I'm like, well, that's a weird, that's a weird answer. Because you would like, what that's saying is, yes, ideally I'd stay here, but I might be happier elsewhere. And so, you know, right. we could be, we we could have 10 days left of Steph, Clay, and Draymond playing together. It's all, you know what I, I mean? Know. That's I was going to say, tonight. You, yeah, you, that, you it's one of That's the last, right. This could be one of the last games they ever play together. Yeah. The, um, so you think that Chicago takes going to aggregate? Oh, I know it's going to, <laughs> I know. I don't, I don't go on those sites. So can you, you guys, send it well, to I'm me listen, when it happens? I'm sure I... someone, one of your producers will. I mean, can you guys just blur my face when we're talking about it? <laughs> uh, just kidding. What if, what if though, think about this possibility. Mm -hmm. What if I just, I just left broadcasting and just did this. Do you think I'd be as happy if I just did the volume? I talked to friends. I did this. I did 90 minutes a day with J Mac, maybe two hours a day. And I didn't really do the broadcasting. And Wait, I just hold on. Did this. What, you just said you did 90 minutes a day with J Mac. That's what is that? What do you mean? Well, I'd hire him at the volume. Oh, I got a show, you. but it'd be like I, 90 minutes oh, I get two it. hours I a day. Um, no, I don't think you'd be as happy. I think that you want to... I think there is... I think you would at some point feel not as in it as you feel right now. Even if media's yeah. changed and all these things, I get it. Like, there is an element of... For anyone, and maybe for younger people than us, it's different. But And I'm obviously, you know, we're not the same age, but we are... Uh, even though we're different generations where something too, I'm on fucking TV every day. And yeah, I know media has yeah. changed. So I don't know. I don't, but I mean, you would, I don't think you'd be unhappy, but I don't know if you'd be as happy. And maybe I'm being selfish. I, will tell you this. I would be sad. I would be sadder if you would, if you, we weren't working at the same place. Anymore. You would be sadder. Will you be with me once? Yeah, a week I on understand, but it's still not like, I like that your show leads into my show. I like that. Yeah. How about this? Ann always makes fun of me when I, because I compartmentalize stuff. I said, Ann, do you understand? I get free parking and free coffee at Fox <laughs> and a smoothie when I leave every day. I get like 12 grand a year. 
<laughs> and my wife is like, that's the stupidest shit I've ever heard in my life. And I'm like, do you understand the ease? Like I told one time I told a broadcaster. You have free shirts too. And I said, I you have free, you have free shirts. Yeah. And I, I told a broadcaster, I said, you know, the makeup ladies come in and they kind of, a little bit of a three minute hair massage and they kind of just kind of get you ready. And I said, I'm not getting that on a podcast. No, they're, I'm not no you're not. And you're, well, if you are, you got to hire them. You got to, you got to do all of it. So you own the company. That's an HR you're right. nightmare. You don't, to, you don't have to hire. No, you don't. You don't want to. All right. The NBA season is in full swing coming down the stretch. Then we move right into the playoffs in April, May, and June. I can't wait. Spice things up with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA right now. All you have to do is put down 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Pretty good trade-off. I pay 5 I get $150. North Carolina listeners, do not forget. Welcome to the party. DraftKings Sportsbook now live in your state, North Carolina. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Takes 90 seconds. The code is Colin, C O L I N. Again, 90 seconds. Download DraftKings Sportsbook app. Put in Colin. New customers bet five, get 150 back in bonus bets instantly. That is the trade. All right. The code is always Colin. The crown is yours. I don't know anybody that's an election denier. <laughs> There's a distortion bubble out there that the, the the craziest people get amplified on your Facebooks, algorithms on social platforms, that uh, there's not as many wackos as you think. Even the people that like Trump uh, don't like a lot about him. They just hate the other side more. So there's a new poll by Associated Press and the uh, NORC Center for Public Affairs and Research. And what they found is striking similarities how Americans think. Almost a 90% agreement on rights to vote, equal protection under the law, right to freedom of religion, freedom of speech, right to privacy. Almost 80% think the right to own a gun is very important to protect. And what they found over and over and over, there are very few fringe people. The media tends to give them oxygen. The algorithms completely feed them uh, on social networks is that there's a complete distortion about what is acceptable, what is not. Almost all people want less crime. Um, how to solve it may be different, but we mostly want the same things. And this goes back to conversations I've had with people. I'm like, I can't live on an island. I hang out in cities like Chicago. Tonight I go to a Warriors Lakers game in Los Angeles. I don't think I'm politically uh, dissimilar to most of them. We're all kind of looking for the same thing. So, and I think one of the jobs, this is where I think big tech can be incredibly harmful, but I do think the media, especially the political media, does a really bad job at one thing, giving oxygen to the fringes. And one of the things I've really worked on, like I've really gotten off social media, I don't associate with wackos on the internet because successful, smart people, happy people are not on the oh. internet all day. So you're talking with lonely losers. Your thoughts I, on this? Well, fight. I wish I were quite as optimistic as you because I think the study, while I don't doubt the veracity of it, leaves out a few maybe, and I haven't read it, I'm listening to you, important details, which is, so 90% of the country, you know what I mean, might not be election deniers and fringe and extreme. But a guy who's got about a 58 to 60 percent chance of running the country is. And so that <laughs> seems problematic. So it can be like, you know, we agree on that January 6th was bad and that the, all these things. 90 percent of us agree. But if somehow through the on the way of agreement to the polls, we're like, but the biggest voice who doesn't agree clearly is now in charge of everything. That seems a little scary. And when you say big tech amplifies it, I don't think it's accidental. And I do wonder when some of the richest, most powerful people in the world seem to have authoritarian leanings. Like, why is that? And, you know, who benefits from that? And how much do they benefit from that? And then there is this factor, which is, let's say it's not even 10% of the country that's just fucking nuts. Let's go lower. Let's go 5%.
Well, I'm pretty good at math. We got 350 million Americans, 5%. That's still 17 to 18 million people you got to corral and deal with in some capacity. We're not a small, it's not a party where there's like 25 people there and it's like, okay, a couple of them are nuts. So I am, I am, I do agree with this. What I find fascinating is, and what maybe the poll was getting at, is the idea that you ask someone what their, if you don't ask someone what their political leanings are, and you say, how do you feel about this topic? How do you feel about this topic? How do you feel about this topic? You will find a ton of common ground, a ton of common ground on the most hot button issues, on guns, on immigration, on abortion, a ton of common ground. And I think, I'm sure that's what this study is showing. But that doesn't seem represented, that common ground, in a lot of the levers of power in this country. And that, to me, is concerning. And it does seem like the divisions are being further exacerbated over the last 10 years. Feels to me that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, cable news feeds into tribalism. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think in most instances the crazy people have any power. Um, I think I, I I mean, it's there's a division of people and, you know, I don't think Trump's going to win. I don't think it's going to be particularly close. Uh, I, I really don't. I think he doesn't get independence. I think he doesn't give women, uh, you know, he women are either going to have the same rights with their body as I am or you're not going to win. Your party is going to really struggle. He's lost elections. People connected to him are losing elections. I think the news over the next six months as Democrats are raising almost 75% more money is bad news for that side. Regardless of what I think, I don't view... Um, well, I, if that's I think true, it will be... then, I, then we could... Yeah. If that is true, then we could have maybe a reorientation. Because, And I think yeah. it could be... Because let's just assume you're that's correct. I, you know, I, the, I don't know that I am as pessimistic about Trump's chances as, as you seem to be, but let's assume that's correct. If that is correct, then I think what, and I wish I had a better uh, grasp on the specific details of when we have seen this happen over the 240 year history of American history, but you've seen it happen at least three times where a political party itself bifurcates, where what you have is a party split. And because of that, that yeah. party goes through a time of reorientation and is out of power for a bit. And I'm not saying that that necessarily is... That's the GOP in that's what I Well, so that's what I would wonder if it would happen. What I wonder, yeah. if Trump were to yeah. lose this... I do wonder if, because yeah. he's not ever going to admit he lost anything. He's not ever going right, to quit. Of course. So then does he, does there become almost like the Whig party, like a third party that is just call it the Trumpers. And it peels yeah. off the, the craziest portion of the, what is now called the Republican party. And then what is left of the Republican party can reorient. And the way it remakes itself is by peeling off maybe, you know, disillusioned center left Democrats. And it's like, hey, yes. you know what I mean? The it, it, Not to bring, it, this is kind of cliche, but where Mitt Romney-esque people are like, hey, this is what the party is again. Because I think a party like that, I'm not trying to betray your politics, but I think you would listen to that Republican party and I bet you have in your life. I think it is probably hard for yeah. you and your friends to even listen to a Republican party that is led by Trump. It's like, I this is just nuts. But you would listen, and so I wonder if that would happen if he loses. If he wins, then it's a different story entirely, obviously. Yeah. I'm going to the UFC fight Saturday with Ann and a couple of Well, you'll see him there. I, I keep thinking. Yeah, give him, yeah, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm Not that I don't have passion about politics, but I don't. I have strong feelings about it, but I, I, I do think like the poll on a Associated Press is that I think cooler heads eventually prevail. I think this nation overwhelmingly makes the right decision. So let, let me get into something else that is less divisive, or maybe it's not. So um, I get asked this a lot by parents or young people. Can you give me advice? Sure. 
And um, I don't think advice is helpful because um, we all live very separate, different lives. Your career and your path is completely different than mine. Mine's completely different than Bob Costas. Yours is completely different than Bob Costas, Al Michaels, and Ian Eagle is that this is not a doctor or an architect or a school teacher. There is no path uh, to being a great comedian. Be funnier. You'll find you're on stage and, and more successful. Sing better will ultimately help you. With YouTube and these platforms, just be better is the answer. So I talked to a young guy today and I said, I didn't have Twitter. I didn't have YouTube. That's better than a resume. Go show your talent. Um, and I was I was saying this when when it's like weight loss. Eat less, move more. You'll lose weight. It's not scientific. Just Google it. And I and I was saying is one of the things I tell young people when I speak to them is the only piece of advice I ever got. I'll give you an opinion. If you ask me for an opinion on something, I'll give you one. That's different. I don't give advice. And I said the only time I've read a sentence and that I've shared it with people because it rings true to me is when I was a kid, I went to a Mariners game upstairs in the booth and Dave Niehaus, a, a pretty uh, well-known, established, iconic Seattle figure, wrote in my program. magazine. My, the uh, program, you know, the yeah. Program, yeah. If you want it bad enough, you'll sit here. And I thought, that's right. it's, like, it's like the Vegas dealer. Yep, that's it. That's it. The advice to all kids, do you want to be me? Right. Because I wanted it yeah. so bad, I'd step on people. Well, and together. and I was so I and I wanted it. I I literally did want to be you. I've told you this story. I called and I've maybe told the story on the air before. I was twenty four years old, literally, literally. This is and I'm thirty nine, right? So I'm twenty four. So this is fifteen years ago. This is not nineteen eighty six, right? This is two thousand nine. In 2009, I signed my first contract. Uh, no, that's wrong. 2010, I signed my first contract. I was making $8 an hour, and then my contract was to do middays in Kansas City. This is not a bullshit job. It's not the greatest job, but Kansas City is a two-sport right. city. You know what I mean? It's a big, yeah. for sports radio, it's a good market. Signed a contract Great market. to do middays in Kansas City for $23,800. Full-time. No benefits, but full time. This was, I think, like when that was allowed. Um, and I was thrilled. It was around the same time that I started dating my now wife. Like I was thrilled. Like I am rolling, making twenty four grand. Um, and at that time, I called an agent and said my pitch was this: I'm sure you wish Colin Cowherd was your client. He's not, and it doesn't appear he's ever going to be. If you would like. To represent the next Colin Cowherd, you'll take me on. That that's what <laughs> I did, and this guy started representing me. Shout out credit to him, Josh Santry, started representing me when I was in Kansas City making twenty four grand, and you know what I mean. Helped me grow and evolve, and then eventually, your agent Nick Khan hired him, and I like that. That is so like we grew together, and yeah. the. What I, so, but the, it, I got a little distracted there because that's such a, to me, a cool story. Um, but the answer is you have to be obsessed with it. And this is what I tell my daughter, who's a theater major. I'm like, hey, any job, there are like, it, there's a few jobs that are the type, the types of jobs that win little kids get asked in class what they want to be. If your job that you want is on that list, you better be goddamn obsessed with it as an adult or else you got no shot. No shot. If it is the type of job that people stop you on the street and are like, oh my God, that's a dream job. The only reason that everyone doesn't do it is because people... Don't want to make 24 grand at 25 years old. You know what I mean? And, right. and I don't want to act like every, and listen, I've been very lucky. There is obviously some natural talent associated with success, whatever it is, but the number, yes. I'm not denying any of that, but the, but what for a lot of people, it stops being worth it. And I don't like, it's just, it's like, man, 
this is a grind. There's not the, the you work weekends, you work holidays, you don't make money, and it's just not worth it anymore. And so it has to be something you have to do if you have any chance of succeeding in it. And then once it's that, then it is, you know, I don't, I don't, you, you've always been very complimentary of my talent, but I don't actually think I am a talented broadcaster. I think I have a very specific talent, which is I'm a great arguer. I'm great logically and I'm great with, you know, figuring out debating argument points. But I, when I applied to Syracuse, uh, when I was doing the tour, I met with the dean and the dean said, great resume, great, you know, SATs, all this stuff. You're the exact type of kid we want to have here. Just so you know, you'll never be a radio personality. You have too nasally of a voice. It won't work. At Syracuse, I got cut from the student radio station because I couldn't figure it out. Like I, it wasn't like some, you know, I look at Noah Eagle and obviously Noah Eagle, I get his dad's eye and Eagle, but the kid is talented. Kid's got great voice, got a yeah. great presence. Like I'm like, oh, he's got real broadcasting talent. I was just wildly obsessed with it. Wildly obsessed with it. And was like, I am going to force my way through it, which is really how you get from I went from 24 grand a year in Kansas City to the TV show on FS1 in seven years. From tw from when I signed that contract in Kansas City to when the TV show launched in New York City, that was seven years. And it was, yes, a ton of good fortune and good luck and good timing, but it was just, I was wildly obsessed with it, which is the number one thing you've got to be. Yeah, that's, and that's the best advice is that when people, um, when parents come up and I, you know, anything that you don't want to give them cliches, work hard, read everything, you know, be detail oriented. And then you kind of appease the parents, you know, placate the parents. But it it really is. Jake Lazer's talked about this before. The people that are great in the NFL, they're crazy. Crazy. They're obsessed. No, it, 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 right. That's exactly right. And it's that's again, because that's a dream job. That's a dream job. Like the there is no, and that's, you know, I worry. I do worry about my my 18-year-old daughter because what she wants to do is about the as hard of a field as there is. She wants to be an actress. And it's like, okay, even the successful ones like struggle yeah. for a long time and all of these things. But who am I to say, don't follow your dreams, follow your dreams. But it's like, there's, if you are in the dream chasing business, you got to chase it. Like that's the, that's the quote that I like, listen, I will support dream chasing as long as you're fucking chasing. I won't support dream daydreaming. Like, oh, I want to be this. I wonder how it's going to happen. I got to see that you are, that yeah. you want it. And the other thing, if there's young people listening that I, that I tell them that is different now than, you know, previous eras, is you do what is, I think, good advice, because I do give this advice, is just do it. You want to be a talk show host and you don't have a talk show, just pretend. The way you pretended in yeah. your bedroom, now yeah. you anyone can pretend on YouTube and make the channel private if you want. Like I was like, it's not about getting the number of subscribers or viewers. It's about the reps. It's about when I first started, I thought I was going to be the funny guy on the radio. And then I was like, nope, that's not the lane. I need to be ardent prick. That's the lane for me and it'll work. And yeah. so like the only way to do it is to do it, to actually get the reps in. And so, yeah, that's the advice I give. And then make sure you do a little check every six months. Be like, do I still love this? Do I still want to do this? That's a good advice. I'm going to the uh, Warriors Lakers. Tonight. That's nice. J Mac got me seats, and then I upgraded in the middle of the show. Hold on, wait a seats. minute. Hold on. What do you mean, J Mac got yeah. you seats? Well, I said I wanted to go to the game, and J Mac goes, "I have seats," and I said, "Where are they? I don't want to sit up with the pigeons. Where are they?" And he said, "Well, they're pretty good seats." And then he showed me. And they're like 17 rows up. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I talked about it on the air. And three minutes later, somebody called and said, I'm like, I'm 10 rows behind the Laker bench. So you're going with them. And I said, oh. And then I was going to call Draymond Green here at the volume and see if I could get better seats. But I thought, oh, I'm going to wait for a playoff game. I don't want to bother Draymond Green. 
So, you know, that's going to be a good game. I like, I, I, I mean, that's going to be a good hey, so game. Let, go ahead. Sorry. So I, this is, I'm going to UFC Saturday night. So this is the time of the year after the football season. I start going to stuff. And so uh, can I throw this at you? So my wife does not like Los Angeles. You know, I was and this gonna, has been going. I was going to ask about that because she seems to spend a lot of time not in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't need yeah. to get into too many details, uh, but I uh, have a place in Chicago yep. and am searching in Chicago for different yep. things. And so I'm going to buy um, some season tickets to the Bulls and Blackhawks. It's a suite, like yep. four people. You can bring friends. You're in Chicago. I can bring you and, you know, you could get food, bar, all that stuff, like second level stuff. I, 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 I like sitting on the floor more, but if I'm going with my wife and, and she's all dolled up and, you know, you want dinner, blah, sure. blah, blah. I, the, for the, for the so, NBA, I think I'd prefer lower level as close to the court as possible. Hockey, yes. I think the suite could be better unless you're right on the glass. This seems like a, I'm sure it's a good setup. And I heard you mention this to Parkins last week. So I was going to ask you about it. So go ahead. So you're going to get the setup in Chicago. Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to get the, the setup in Chicago and I've, and I've got to be honest with you is um, because sometimes what we do, um, and I do mornings, it's really hard in Los Angeles because I have to get up at like 5.30 in the morning. So I don't want to be getting in my car at 9.28 in Los Angeles, a 40-minute drive home, get to bed, yep. you're all amped up. And so in Chicago, if I move my show to Chicago, think about this, show starts at 11. I get up at eight. Well, yeah, you're doing middays then, but you're doing middays with the mornings. Yeah, of course. So I'm thinking about. Oh it. wow! Is that are you breaking news money. here? This is. Are you sure you want to include this on the podcast? This is going to be aggregated. <laughs> this is going to be. I the. I mean, go ahead, it's your thing. Do whatever you want. What I'm thinking, quality of life now, because this is a big deal. This is. I'm not going to get into negotiations. I have you know, ten months left or whatever. At both my at all my contracts. And one of the things I've thought about is um, quality of life. My wife doesn't love Los Angeles. We have friends here, but it's a three hour flight. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm on a plane every weekend. I don't give a rip. Uh, Delta has been good to me. So I've been thinking about this and I, well, what do you think about oh, this? Boy. I'd still be in Los Angeles, you know, for stuff. But what if I did my show in Chicago? My wife loves it. I love the city. I love where we live. I'm 12 minutes to the Bulls games. I could literally have a life at night. I want to go to games. I want to go to concerts. I've given that up in my life. My whole life, I'm like 11 o'clock news guy and then morning radio guy. Enough already. I want to go to All games right, at so night. So listen, I am, and I know, I mean, this is going to obviously be, this is real news. It's going to be aggregated. I don't really feel totally comfortable, but that's fine. I'll roll with it. Um, <laughs> uh, here's what I would say. You're Colin Coward and you just turned 60. You kind of do whatever you want. Like that you're you're in a spot where you are able to be like, hey, this is, these are the parameters under which I, you know, that this makes sense for me. No hard feelings in any direction. Like yeah. that's, that is what, yeah. you know, I, the, I, again, I don't want to, I'm going to bring up someone who I have massive respect for and has been incredibly kind to me, even though we've never actually met in person. I don't know what all went into SVP getting the studio in the DC area, but I'm sure it was something right. along the lines of I'm SVP and this is what I want. You know what I mean? And yeah. it makes sense. I'm a, I'm a performer. I, you know what I mean? I produce for you. This makes my life better. So let's find a way to make it work. Um, I mean, the biggest winner. Yeah, the record. Ahead. Sean Hannity doing a show from Naples. Half the time, guys are doing it from Long Island. Tucker Carlson was in Maine. For the record, Fox has been great. iHeartRadio, but they, they don't have a problem with it. But I, I like LA, and I'd still be here for a lot of you know in, during the football season, especially especially in January, of February. Course. I'd find myself yeah, here the again. fall there. I but, mean, I, they, the second, I got, the, the biggest yeah. winner of this, if it were to happen, is Anne, your wife. The second biggest yes. winner, I think, is new friend of the podcast, Danny Parkins. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you're you're down the street. I I mean J Mac hot seat coming up. Like uh, that, that's a, I mean that's a real. I mean you're just he's right there. Um, but that would be. I mean, listen. I think that's a. 
I think that's fascinating. I obviously, uh, I heard you talk about getting season tickets and that kind of struck me. I was like, but you live in LA. Um, but I also know just from knowing you personally and talking to you that your, I mean, your wife seemed to spend a lot of time in Utah and Chicago. So, so you know what I mean? Unless yeah. she had a warrant in California, it didn't make a ton of sense that, you know, aside from just, yeah. well, you get to a point where, um, and, and I've, and this is one of the reasons I created this company is if, if things didn't work out, if like, I couldn't come to an agreement the next day, I'm fine. You know, Tucker Carlson leaves. He doesn't have a company. I can talk for hours about any subject I want to. And so, you know, I, this is something I've, I've thought a lot about. I've talked a lot about is, is I'm 60 years old. I've done really well for myself. I've been smart with my money. Um, I have given up for years. I did the 11 o'clock news and, you know, you give up a lot. And then all of a sudden it's like, now I do morning stuff. I would like to go to more games. Like I had to take a big nap this afternoon because I'm going to the Warriors Lakers. I'll have to take a sleeping pill to zonk myself out tonight. And I find when I go to Chicago, Ann and I have a blast. We're going out every single night doing fun and so stuff. The, the Well, I mean, the other element is, and this is where, you know, shout out to uh, Skip, who's done this schedule for forever. The super early yeah. mornings, but I, you know, I did the super, super early mornings in New York for up until 18 months ago. And before that, I did morning radio in Houston and the, the it's it, yes, waking up sucks. Like everybody knows waking up sucks, whatever. But it, so what? That's not really the problem. The problem is what you're alluding to, which is the lack of thing, the, the stuff you can't do at night that you want to be yeah. able to do. You know what I mean? The 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 friends dinners. You know what I mean that you know are going late and people are drinking wine and you're like I don't, you know, I can't make that or I can't make that happen and certainly the NBA games. The NBA, like it's it, it when I was doing mornings, people would ask me all the time like how are you able to watch the games? And I'm like, "Well, watching the games is not that hard because I'm laying in bed." Like, you know what I mean? I'm laying yeah. in bed watching the game, and the moment it's over, I can be asleep within 30 seconds. Really, you know what I mean? If it's a late night West Coast Lakers game, and I'm in New York when I'm doing mornings, and I got to be up at 4 a.m., or back then I had to be up at 3 30, um, I can just fall asleep, get three hours of sleep, and then take a nap at the end of the day. But what you can't do is go. What you can't do is go to anything late because then yeah. it's another all of it. So, yeah, I get that. I mean, that, that'd be, I mean, that's unbelievable. And like the NBA this time of year, it is so exciting. And being, and oh, it's being great. there is great. And being the, I know that, you know, you're, Anne likes live music and events and things like that. We went to, by the way, I'll send you the clip. Pretty cool. So we went to, me, my wife, and my older daughter went to see Drake and Lil Wayne at the Prudential Center in Newark uh, Friday night. And Lil Wayne through FS1 and I have become very good friends. And when he took the stage, when he took the stage, the first words out of his mouth were, shout out to Nick Wright and his family. Thanks for being here. And that's the greatest rapper arguably to ever live. Shouting at my daughter almost passed out. And then after the concert, got to see him. But that type of thing, if I was doing mornings, if it wasn't on a Friday night, I just couldn't have gone. You know what I mean? We were back home. It, it wasn't even that late of a night. Like we were back home at midnight, but I couldn't have done that when I was doing mornings, unless it happened to me on a Friday or Saturday. So I understand that entirely. Yeah, I think it's, and for the record, I love LA. I've got my friends here. Um, it's not like I'd ab abandoned, like, yeah. you know, I, I know that I really like so many things. I got my daughter lives here, my stepsons. Uh, there's a lot here I like, but it is when you get older and you establish things, podcasting, Nick, to me, has been, um, I'm not a podcaster. I'm a broadcaster who can do a podcast, but I don't consider myself a podcaster. But I will say one of the great things about the volume is I don't need marketing dollars. I don't need real estate. Is I can do it wherever I want. I'm in a tiny little room right now in my house. I don't watch other podcasters, but outside of a Joe Rogan, most people don't have a studio. They're in their house. Nobody cares. This is an audio business. And yeah, so- Yeah, like, I don't know where, like, you know, I don't know where- uh, where, I mean, I don't know for certain where Shannon does the nightcap, but I would bet anything yeah. 
he has built out, you know, he has used a room in his house for a studio. Yeah. He walks down the hall yeah. and does that. You know what I mean? And then he's, and it looks great. It looks professional. It looks awesome, but it doesn't have to go somewhere to do it, which is, I mean, I don't know if people can tell now I'm in my office. Uh, hence the penance on the back. And like, it's very low. Yeah, no, Shannon, Shannon walks right down um, in his place to do yep. that. And, you know, that, that, that's one of the things that when uh, Shannon left FS1 and came over, I said, listen, this is going to be an easier life. It'll be a really fun life is that I'm not really a helicopter boss. Go entertain America. I'll find you staff, help elevate the show. And, you know, he did a great job. He was a big fan of Ocho and uh, Gilbert Arenas. They've been great with him. But um, and he had real connections there and, and he, he had good instincts, very good broadcasting instincts. But that, I think that that is one of the things that I've thought about continually is that this is there are certain cultures that change as you age in all industries. And, you know, like I'm a big believer in the four day work week. I'm a big believer in Barry Diller, one of the smartest guys in the history of media, is a big believer in we are moving to four days a week and Friday is flexible that you don't really have to come in on Fridays. You can Zoom that people, you know, people now are going to. If you don't offer that, they're going to move to companies that do. And young people have so much mobility now. And like, I'll give you an example. In Los Angeles, it's virtually impossible for talented young people, both making 80, 90, 100 a year, to buy a house and not have to drive an hour and a half to work. Well, what if those, at the volume, I've allowed people to go live in Charlotte. Oh. Go live in Chicago. Go My, my CEO lives in Delaware or New Hampshire. So the, the reality is the quality of people that I've accumulated at the volume because they're allowed to live anywhere. I mean, I could go to any company and poach people and say four days a week during the football season, Sunday and Monday are actually huge. Saturday is kind of big. Thursday, Friday aren't. Yep. You make your schedule. You just got to work Sunday. And it's remarkable the quality of people you can find. Like our staff is full of like incredibly talented well, people. Well, the and. And that is something I don't know enough about corporate America because I've never had like a real job um, to know how this is going to, you know, play out over the next 15, 20 years. But there is the the uh, being able to draw from as wide of a field as possible because it's not you're not only drawing from your geographical region where people can, you know, within a 60 minute drive to your office space you would have to think that the most flexible as far as it, it the wider net you have is I, I i can hire anyone in the country because there is no specific place they have to get to every day you would be able to find right. the most talented people as opposed to i can only hire people around my geographic footprint that's just obvious yeah. I mean, that's why I would argue hockey, baseball, and basketball are so talented now because they're not domestic. Um, football is really American. Our classic football is, is you know, the pads. It, it's, it's, I mean, this labyrinth of college programs feeding it. It's just different. You know, Canada doesn't have that. Europe doesn't have sort of our collegiate system. But once you can go global and get people, it's, it's remarkable the volume. I've got people in Sarasota, in New Hampshire, in Delaware. We have six people on these calls. I don't even know where they live. <laughs> I think one lives in Los Angeles. You're right now I'm in New York. In yeah, New York. I'm in Manhattan. Colin, enjoy the game. Tell your buddy Draymond, you know, I'm not sorry for the things I said on television today, but I understand why he might not have liked them. But that's fine. <laughs> well, he's offended people a few times. See you, All right, buddy. buddy.